everybody. Um, and thank you. Uh, let me add my, my welcome uh, to Interchange uh, today and this morning. I'm really impressed, actually. Everyone's chosen to get the early trains and get up here or, or down here or across or whatever you've done um, in time to hear the opening keynotes and so on. So um, thank you very much for joining this, well, not quite first ever Interchange Conference, but certainly the first Interchange Conference in, in its new format as it is now. So as you've just been hearing from Steve, um, to me, what this... I guess moment today and then into tomorrow actually marks is a moment of proper evolution, possibly even revolution from kind of transport conferences past um, to give us a really good indicator in terms of where we're going in terms of transport conferences future. So I want to begin actually with a huge thanks to the steering group. Now, <laughs> those of you who are here, and there's quite a lot of you on the steering group who are here already this morning, I'm not going to lie in terms of our steering group meetings that we held in the run-up to this, um, this event today. Let's just say it was a slightly eclectic group of people, a slightly unusual group of people, um, but actually a really, really great thing. I think we all arrived in the room knowing some of the people who were going to be around that steering board uh, table, but I think it's fair to say that with the exception of Andrew and Paul, none of us actually knew everybody. Now that is a really good echo of what Steve was just saying there, because actually it just shows how the transport sector is changing and moving and shifting in terms of new participants and so on. Um, as I say, it was a slightly um, eclectic, maybe a slightly unusual group. I think we all joined in because we could see the value that we could each bring from our own point of view, but we had no real idea what it was going to lead to in terms of you know, where that effort would actually sort of take us to in terms of the end programme. Um, so I'd say there was no shortage of ambition. That became fairly obvious from the first discussion. We were actually going to solve world peace along the way, as well as everything else that we were going to do to do with transport. Um, there was definitely no shortage of ideas. Again, right from the very, very first discussion we had, we, we had all sorts of stuff. I felt really sorry for Paul, actually. He went away with, I don't know how many pages filled in his book of all these different things that we were going to have to cover over these next two days. Um, we then went through a whole series of multiple program redrafts. I think it was several per steering group meeting where we basically ripped it all up and started again and kept on reshaping it and so on. More ideas came through. There was quite a lot of plain speaking, I would say. Um, some differences of opinion, not quite bickering, but you know, at times it was, it was quite interesting in terms of trying to, trying to chair this group. More ideas came through. Actually, it was fun, though. And as I say, overall, I think all of us have come away from it with a sense of a, a, you know, a better group of connections compared with the, the start point. So my sincere thanks, actually. I'm being slightly flippant there. But my sincere thanks to the steering group in terms of what we've actually created. So I really hope that as you go through today and tomorrow that you will recognise some of the themes that we've tried to bring through and that you will actually appreciate that what we've tried to do here is genuinely, genuinely to create something that really is quite different in overall terms. So our goal in putting forward a, a programme and shaping it and finalising it, you can imagine all the iterations that go on in that, in terms of creating that program um, that's, that's become this event, our goal was to bring together as many of these different perspectives from the whole of the transport sector, and in some cases slightly beyond it and on the very edges of it and internationally and so on as well, and to bring together those different things across a set of key themes for change. So starting with the really obvious one, and, and again, Steve's already mentioned it, and, and you'd expect me to talk about this given what I've been talking about relentlessly, I guess, for the last few years around the industry anyway. Um, there is obviously a core conference theme on decarbonisation towards net zero. So our attack strategy, basically, towards a genuine net zero position, properly defined, that's really, really difficult, in time to ward off the worst effects of climate change. But there's also a twin angle that should come through in some of the sessions on climate resilience. That's our defensive strategy on the basis that actually there are, there's a lot of change already baked in and we need to make sure that we have that defensive piece in place. And if we think that we are remotely on the case with that across not just the transport sector but more generally across the infrastructure sectors and the way they all interact with systems and systems of systems, we are kidding ourselves. So there is an awful lot on that today. There is more on that tomorrow. And I know it's also a theme that comes through in terms of the uh, Transforming Infrastructure Performance or the TIP Live event that's also running in parallel tomorrow. Now, you're not going to be surprised to hear me say any of that bit because, of course, I'm going to stand up here and talk about climate. But actually, wider than that, you should also spot, in terms of the programme over the next couple of days, a much wider theme around transport as it relates to properly defined sustainability. Now, I'm not going to spend the next hour talking about definitions of sustainability. I would suggest that if anybody isn't quite sure why it's not just carbon, why it's not just climate, why it's not just environmental and so on, a quick look at Google, main sponsor and so on, will help you to understand what, what, the, uh, what the wider implications are in terms of this side of things. So proper 
transport sustainability. So here I'm talking about, yes, the environmental aspects of it, but also the economic and the social outcomes that we're trying to drive in terms of what a good transport system, good transport solutions actually look like in terms of supporting quality of life, uh, personal community safety, and, and similar. And that's because transport, as we know, is an enabler and it's a derived demand, but it's also a key connector in terms of people and places and goods, and it is absolutely critical to our onward quality of life on the planet. We've got to do all of this so much better in the context of the climate crisis. It's not about more of the old thinking or faster old thinking. It's actually about new thinking. So across the two-day program, you're going to pick up all sorts of core threads and themes around places, so urban, rural, everything in between, modes, all of them, <laughs> the traditional ones, also the more modern ones, uh, data and digital, the role that that is and can and should and must and ought, pl ought to play across everything we do, the systems piece, I've already mentioned that, systems thinking, helping us to understand the connections that exist and how one thing can help another thing or indeed make another thing much more difficult to achieve in practice, but across all of those, people and behaviours. And I guess it's really obvious, but I, I often find when I'm talking to people who live their lives in, in a highly technical transport space, sometimes we forget that actually what we're trying to do is put good solutions out there that help people to behave in the way we want them to actually behave. It, it's, a, it's a bit of a sort of a, a confidence trick, I suppose, or a, a sort of a way of persuading people to do things. And if you think about how and why people do things, it's because they are easy, it's because they're understandable, it's because they're affordable, it's because they basically offer a, a better way of doing things than the other options that might be available to them. It's all about friction. So if we can find ways of reducing the friction to encourage people to do the things we actually want them to do, to use the transport systems in ways that, our, that, that will support lower carbon outcomes, that will support that resilience, that will support the social and, and the wider economic outcomes, we've got to be onto a winner. And in some ways, nothing in that is new, but the context is very, very different. So I think it's all about figuring out how we get that, that behavioral piece, that behavioral science piece, to, to work in our favor rather than sometimes running against it. But I guess if you just unpack one layer deeper in terms of the program, I think there are three other core themes I just wanted to mention in closing that should leap out across the interchange program. You won't necessarily see them in the headlines of the session titles, but they are there, and they're running as a sort of a drumbeat underneath everything we're doing. And each of them... We're trying to articulate this in the context of 2023, even though some of them, as I say, have actually been around for decades. So the first one is all about getting really much, much more comfortable with change. And it's obvious from everything I've said so far, because what we're talking about in the context of the transport sector is that everything is constantly changing and moving and shifting. And to some extent, it always has been. But the difference here is the driver behind it and that climate crisis piece that is pushing us without option to make us do things differently as opposed to us choosing in a discretionary sense to do things differently. So if we simply mirror what we've been doing so far and maybe try and do more of that and maybe go a bit faster on that, there's no way we're going to get a different outcome to the thing we've already got. And the thing we've already got is a really important contributor, in fact, the largest domestic contributor to climate and carbon emissions in the UK today and indeed in many other developed countries as well. So that's not an option to just keep doing what we've already been doing. And actually it goes beyond that because it's not just lazy to think about doing it that way, it's actually damaging. Because it's not a case that it's passive. If we just carry on doing what we've always, always done, we are continuing to contribute to the problem. We're actually going backwards. And I'm pretty confident, I to hope, that I'm sitting or standing in a room full of people where actually all of us are keen to help. We don't come to work to cause harm, right? So I think that piece about getting comfortable with change is really, really important and really getting in the front of our minds the fact that actually choosing not to change is not just passive, it's actually causing harm. The second piece is around skills and particularly new skills for better decisions. And I'm hoping Jesse Norman, when he arrives shortly, might say a little bit more about this um, in the context of DFT and the skills initiative that um, he is minister for and which I am also chairing. Um, but linked really closely to my change point um, just a moment ago, we're going to have to get to grips with the new skills that we really need for the transport sector if we're going to home in on those right outcomes for the 2020s and beyond, so those social, environmental, and economic outcomes that we're after. So our old school skills, if you like, the traditional transport skills that we're all very, very familiar with and comfortable with, to some extent... Some of it can survive, but it all needs a good kick and a good refresh, and then we need to bring through new skills across everything we're trying to do, everything I've mentioned so far, and that needs to be delivered through a far greater diversity of people 
representing communities out there at large who actually are able to bring across a, a wider set of mindsets, a, a different set of solutions, all that kind of thing. The side benefit, if we get that skills bit a bit more right, so if everybody in the sector starts to change in terms of the way they're thinking and the skill sets they bring to the table, but equally we start to recruit people with some of those new wider skills, so things like climate skills, behavioral science skills, and so on, if we get that more right, we also solve another problem, in my view, which is around the transport sector being largely invisible and largely irrelevant and often not very interesting to people. What if we could actually use this moment as a chance to become more visible, relevant, interesting, attractive, appealing, a place people actually want to and aspire to work in terms of the change we can actually make on the ground? That, to me, is really exciting and flips the climate crisis point from being terrifying, which it should be, to something that actually is exciting because people can feel they're actually making a real change on the ground. And I guess that brings me around to my last thought, really, which is to do with the pace of change. Because I've talked a lot about the direction of change. We've talked a lot, in fact, both Steve and I have talked a lot about the fact that we know we need to decarbonise. We know we need to get towards net zero. We know we need to take that climate action piece and so on. But actually, it's not just about the direction of change. It's also about the pace of change. And to be honest, in some ways, that probably matters more in a funny way, because actually we know broadly which direction we're going to want to go. And it's natural we want to find, you know, the perfect answers. We want to optioneer the life out of things in terms of making sure we're about to do exactly the right thing. But sometimes we're just going to have to be brave and we're going to have to be bold, because actually the climate crisis, just to come around full circle, changes the game. It is not optional whether or not we decarbonise. If we, if we decide that there is a climate crisis, which I hope we've all sort of got on board with, really, it means that the speed of change really does matter. So decarbonisation, as I say, is, it's not an optional activity. Net zero is not an optional outcome, and transport is one of the sectors at the heart of the problem. And there is no route to net zero without the decarbonisation of the transport sector. So, so the piece around the attack strategy, that, that piece to net zero, the, the piece around the, the defense piece in terms of the resilience and so on as well, the fact that the impacts are not equitable right now and will most affect the communities and the people who have least to begin with, that kind of thing. If we get this wrong and we go too slowly, we're gonna create more problems, which has more cost, more risk, et cetera, et cetera, attached to it. And also, in the meantime, the climate crisis just grows. So if we want to go for the least cost least risky solution, the answer is to start to make that change really, really fast, so to accelerate the pace of change and to actively look for ways to actually do that every single day. Um, the, the, I suppose it's sort of, it's sort of a, a comedy point, but yet not funny at all, actually, really think about it, because actually if we don't start to go much, much faster on this, we, we may have a short window where we can kind of regret that we didn't go a bit faster in the slightly longer run. But actually, in the really, really long run, there won't be anybody here. Literally, there will not be anybody to have that thought or voice that opinion because we will have missed our chance. And as Steve said, this is genuinely an existential threat. There will be nobody left to listen in the grand scheme of things. So it, it is terrifying. But at the same time, at least we are all in careers where we have the ab ability to do something about it. So I guess I close by asking whether or not you all feel you really are acting with that sense of urgency, as if there really is a, a crisis. What are you doing today to change things towards those better outcomes? Do you have the right information? Do you feel you understand the problem enough? If not, do something to change that. If you're in a senior role, be the person that encourages some of the others in your teams to actually go and find out about what better solutions might look like. If you're in a junior role, speak up. Don't just sit and wait for somebody else to do something differently or think, oh, I wish I worked for somebody who understood this climate problem. Be the person who understands the climate problem. Be the person who talks about it. And I, and I don't mean sort of tomorrow and, and the next day and the next day. I mean actually from right now. So it's a pretty weighty start point, um, but it is genuinely what I'd ask all of you to have in mind um, as you join in with all of the sessions today. So I hope I've kind of unpacked there the, the kind of the themes on the pieces of the, the actual program and the bits of paper, but also then running through in terms of that undercurrent of what we've tried to do in terms of pulling all of this together. Um, just one last thought is that, that the program today is intentionally very fluid. Yes, the sessions overlap. Yes, there are multiple rooms running. Yes, there are multiple things happening at different times. You are absolutely welcome to move around between sessions. Frankly, the lights are so bright, you can't see if anybody moves away anyway, so it's absolutely fine. So please do move around between sessions if you need to. There is no obligation, once you've sort of sat in a chair, to feel that you're absolutely stuck in that place for the next however many minutes. If you are interested in another session and you want to just dip in and out, 
please do that, because that's the way that we can get the best out of this interchange of ideas, out of this inter interchange of people, and, and so on. You can go away with the, with the most value from the next couple of days. So for me, it's a chance to, to embrace and to understand and really dive into, I guess, this latest shape of transport as it's newly defined for the mid-2020s. So thank you. Have a fantastic day. And I think I'm now going to hand back to Nicola. Thank you very much. Thank you.